so we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to our July Tuesday topic in horticulture slash entomology today. So we are really excited to welcome Dr. Jennifer Ceruto with us today, and I hope that you already know who she is. Um, she's been making a great impact in apiculture all across the state in what the year year and a half i've lost track since she's been here yeah so. about a year and a half <laughs> okay yeah 18 months okay so um so we're really glad to have her here today and she's going to be sharing some about the practical but also some ecological aspects of pollinator gardening and, and the way that it pertains to what you might be doing or might be thinking about doing in some of your own uh, growing areas. So I'll let her um, jump in and kind of take it away and introduce herself. Um, so my name is Jennifer Ceruta. I am originally from California, but I have spent some time in my schooling at Purdue in Indiana and at Clemson in South Carolina. And I arrived here um, the beginning of 2019. So I've, this is my second official season here. So the, the rain and the humidity is Pretty similar to South Carolina, but it still takes a little bit of getting used to for uh, someone from California who's used to a dry heat. Um, so yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, pollinator habitats, how to establish them, and um, just some practical tips and some examples from some plots I have um, here, as well as what I had in, in other states. And then we'll talk a little, we'll take a break and discuss a little bit about that. And then we'll talk a little bit about how pollinators actually use the habitat. So why are we actually doing this? Um, so hopefully it'll give us a big, um, broad idea of how, what we're doing to make functional landscapes. I mean, that's kind of what this plot here I have showing too. It's sometimes with those pollinator habitats, you get a lot of weeds too. And that's okay because oftentimes those weeds are what actually help feed the bees. But we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. So as you guys probably know, when people talk about planting pollinator habitat, people are always say, what should I plant? Right, that's always like, what's, what's the, the recipe? What do I need to do to help the pollinators? And while we totally appreciate um, those efforts, it's a lot more complicated than that, as you guys know as gardeners, right? So it's not just what to plant. The real question that they should start with is how to plant, because there are so many different considerations um, in terms of what you're going to put out in your landscape um, that will thrive and do well and not just um, exist and maybe need a lot of babying. Ideally, we want things that once we plant it, um, we'll do well, we'll continue to thrive, we'll reproduce and um, make more food for our pollinators. So we talked about how to plant. Um, one of the key things is really paying attention to the site itself and understanding the history of that land um, and preparing that site as well as you can. Or if you don't prepare it well, be prepared to deal with um, the issues with things like the weed seed bed. So um, those weeds that are going to come up eventually every time you dig in that soil. And so there are different ways we can prepare that land. I guess the first thing too is knowing the history of that land. Sometimes people will say, oh, there's I have this great plot nearby. Um, it's just this empty field of dirt and I, I'd, love to pollen, or I'd love to plant a pollinator habitat there. And as you guys know, if it's just an empty field of dirt and it's not even growing weeds, that's probably not a great location for growing pollinator habitat. It needs to be able to grow and sustain some kind of plant life um, in order to be a good site for pollinator habitat. So knowing the history there, um, kind of getting an idea of what type of plants are growing out there, what types of, of weeds will also help in understanding what types of um, weed seed bed you might be dealing with in the future. Um, okay, so yeah, paying attention to that um, history of the land is really important, but also making sure that you're prepping that land well. And so I do mention here um, ways that we can prepare that land. Um, so you can disc the, the land, you can plow, you can burn, you can smother. Um, disking will bring up more of the weed seed bed of those buried seeds that are in there. So oftentimes, um, if you're going to disc up the land, you may want to do another um, plastic treatment or something to kill the growth that's going to come up there. Um, and I do mention herbicides. A lot of people get uh, upset if I'm talking about pollinators and to talk about herbicides at the same time seems counterproductive or that I'm harming the bees, but there are ways you can use herbicides in a functional, in a way that will um, help you prepare the land, but not harm your bees. So in this case, if it's a lot of um, weedy material especially grasses that aren't um, attractive to the bees and they aren't coming to that area, the exposure is really, the exposure risk is lower. Um, 
if it's an area where there are things blooming that the bees are visiting, one key thing, regardless of what type of site it is, if it's acres and acres or if it's a small um, flower bed in your yard, you want to um, mow down what's blooming there that the bees are attracted to. Give them a few days to learn other site locations where there are flowers for them to visit so they don't visit your site so that when you do your herbicide application, they won't be coming to visit that area. And you wanna be careful too, if you have other flowering plants nearby, you can cover them with a tarp so they don't get exposed to the herbicide as well. Um, and yeah, so I mentioned that weed seed bed. So that's all the seeds that are in the soil from previous, um, plant growth before. And so I'm going to show you some pictures later on of um, some issues I have in one of my sites with pigweed. And so if you guys have ever dealt with pigweed, once that flowers and, and goes to seed, all of those seeds now fall into the soil, or most of them, and it's thousands if not millions of seeds depending on the size of your plot. And those are now basically sowed seed and so they're ready to go. And some of them get buried and so they may not um, germinate the, the next season, but it could show up um, the year after that. And especially if you're working the soil, you can bury some of those seeds deeper in the soil. And then when you work the land again later on, you can bring those seeds back up. And so then they can bloom or they can germinate later on. So that's why we're really concerned about making sure we're prepping that site and killing as many of those weeds um, and their seeds uh, before you start putting in your pollinator habitat. So let's see, to the next bit. So especially when we think about perennials, because typically if we're putting in perennials that are coming back year after year, we don't want to be going into the plot and interfering too much. We don't want to be um, messing, disking the soil too much and disturbing those perennials because they're already established there. Um, so you really have one shot to prep that, that area. So you really want to put um, a lot of effort into making sure you've done um, the prep work. And I know a lot of people get excited about putting in pollinator habitat um, and they want to put in things and have flowering uh, plants, as, you know, like this season, if not next week. But sometimes if you really want to do a good job preparing your land, it may take, um, you know, six months to a year to really prepare that um, area, depending on what the history is of that spot. Um, let's see. Let's see. Soil testing is a key thing, too, because you want to make sure that you have the right nutrients in that, um, in that plot. So you can take your soil sample to any of your county extension offices and have it tested. Um, then they'll give you some recommendations about whether or not you need to amend the soil. Um, sometimes you know, fertilizer is needed, sometimes lime is needed to adjust the pH. There's a lot of different considerations there. Really, you're setting up the plot to, be, um, to have all the nutrients and have all the nourishment for the plants that you're putting in there so they can live long term. It can be, you can still amend the soil later on, but it's a lot easier to do all your prep work in the front end rather than once you have things growing. Um, now if we start talking about what to plant, again, we have a whole lot of factors to consider uh, before we start making our, our list and going out shopping. So the site selection is key, right? So if you guys, you're already into gardening, you should know that, you know, where you're putting this pollinator plot um, really affects what you can put in there. So a lot of it has to do with region. So what's going to grow in this area may not be necessarily what grows in, um, like in my past experience, California or vice versa. There are some plants I really miss that grow out in California that I can't grow out here. Um, irrigation and moisture is key, right? So uh, this time of year, we're lucky when we get these rainstorms that happen because we are getting some um, natural rainfall. But if we don't have irrigation out in our plots, we're relying solely on rainfall. And that can be hit or miss, especially this time of year. And it also depends on what region you're in. Um, let's see, sunlight, of course, that's going to be really key too. So if you're working in areas um, where you have a lot of shade, those are going to be very different plants than what you would plant in something in a really um, bright, sunny area. Um, same thing, you know, if you have some plants that need partial sun, um, or if you are thinking about things like trees, um, there's a lot of light and, and irrigation water requirements there that you need to think about. Also pests, so um, that's something I'm dealing with right now. Not just insect pests, but deer, right? So I have deer coming in and, and chewing off um, a lot of my sunflowers right now, which is a little bit of a pain, um, but I'm feeding wildlife in, in one way or another. I'm hoping there's still enough left that they're going to um, be some some bee food eventually and later on in the season and another thing is permanent so is this site um, an area that you plan on having around long term for pollinators or is this something where you have um, an empty strip of land 
say on the farm or in some other area just for right now, just for this one season. That's going to affect what you want to plant there. Um, if it's something long term, you can think about putting in trees and perennials, but if it's something that's just going to be a flash in one season, um, you may want to consider doing things like annuals that will come up this year um, and are less of an investment. And speaking of that, um, what you plant um, can vary a lot in, in terms of um, cost and, and financing there. So we'll talk a little bit later about some seed blends. Um, and I prefer doing seed blends because I'm usually doing larger plots. Um, but you can also do plugs or whole plants, but of course that's going to cost you a lot more um, if you're you know, per plant per seed, obviously the, the plants cost a lot more. And then even within the seed blends, there's a lot of variation in, in cost there. Um, also consider your individual goals and preferences. Um, are you someone who wants to only plant native plants? Um, are you someone who's more open to planting non-natives that are not invasive? Um, do you have specific specific pollinators that you're trying to feed? So if you're a beekeeper and you want to feed your honeybees, um, there's a different set of recommendations for that versus if you're trying to feed um, native bees or um, butterflies. We'll talk a little bit later about um, um, flower shape for that um, and the mouth parts. Um, there's a lot of these different considerations. And so this is one reason why we don't have um, just an, an easy recipe laundry or yeah, a specific list of plants that just say plant this for the bees and you'll be set. We wanna make sure that um, we cater to your specific location to make sure that um, you will have success. Um, also thinking about what to plant, uh, just some general guidelines though. You know, I don't wanna just leave you hanging and say, okay, you know, you need to think about your specific site and I'm not gonna give you any recommendations. Um, just some general um, guidelines for bees whether they are wild or managed bees, meaning whether they're honeybees or um, bumblebees that are managed for pollination, or if they're just um, native bees out in the environment. And there are also um, wild bees that are not honeybees that are also not native to the United States. Um, not all wild bees are native bees. Uh, but there is a study uh, fairly recently looking at overall some plants that provide good nectar and pollen resources for both types of bees. And so, um, Lots of great uh, recommendations there and plants that grow really well and easily here. Um, one nice thing about the Asteraceae family is that they tend to bloom later in the year. And that's something that we're usually looking for, um, at least with honeybees, is having something that will sustain the colonies through the late summer and early fall. Spring, there's a lot of things blooming, but later on in the season, there's not as much. Um, goldenrod is a great one. I'm fortunate where I am, there's a, a a huge field of goldenrod um, and wing stem that's within flight range of my bees. So it's not, it's not even my plot, but someone else has it planted and so my bees can go and, vis go and visit it as well. Um, native legumes can be really great as well. Um, nice thing about legumes obviously is that um, they can be nitrogen fixing. So that's a, a nice benefit of them beyond feeding pollinators. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try and turn down the volume on this one, maybe. Well, actually, this one's not too loud, but some of the other videos might be a little bit um, loud. But this pycnanthemum, so um, mountain mint, is one of my favorites. And my honeybees don't visit it that much because I typically have a lot of other things I've planted for them. But you could see that there were so many different native bees flying around on this. Also, a really great smelling plant. Um, and you, if you look at those flower heads, they're um, composite flower heads. So there's not a whole lot of blossoms at any one time, but you can see that there's going to be a sustained bloom period for this plant because there are so many of those flowers on the flower head that will eventually bloom. Um, one thing too that we want to think about are um, these plant lists that get put out there. One thing, and this is one reason why I don't love these plant lists, is that uh, right now a lot of the lists are based on attraction only. So they aren't based off of nutritional value and how good the, the resources are for um, the pollinators. Um, and when we think about pollinators, we'll talk about it later on, is the value of um, pollen in addition to nectar. It's not just about nectar. And oftentimes the attraction is due to nectar, sugary sweets, um, but the pollen is a really important resource for them as well. That's their protein resource. Um, so, you know, I just I point this out in terms of thinking about attraction versus nutrition. Um, if you were to, you know, look at a list of the foods that I eat, my diet list, um, it wouldn't necessarily be everything that's nutritious and good for me, right? So I have a lot of cheat days, especially now that, you know, I don't have to go into work and 
like put on nice clothes anymore. Um, what we're attracted to aren't, isn't necessarily what's best for us. And so oftentimes these lists um, don't take into, consider, take into consideration nutrition. There is a lot of research now on this area. So hopefully we'll be able to get that list of nutritious plants and cross-reference it with attractive plants and come up with this master list of um, really good plants that the bees like and, uh, or that the pollinators like, that's also very good for them. Um, one thing also to point out is that there are plants that produce toxins and the bees don't necessarily know this. So they will still forage on these plants um, and it can kill the bees themselves or it can also kill their um, developing um, larvae and pupae, the next generation of bees. Um, people ask, well, why, why don't they know? It's the same thing with us. There are a lot of toxins in the environment that we don't, um, we don't identify or know that are toxic to us. And so if it's something teamed with a sugary reward, um, they will still um, visit it and bring back those resources. So something to also consider is that not all flowering plants are necessarily good for bees and pollinators. Um, also just some laundry listing. I pulled these out of um, where, uh, or some of the different pollinator lists from different um, seed blends. Um, these are just some general um, plants that we see over and over again in these, um, in these seed blends and they grow pretty well. Um, one really nice thing about um, when, you, when you look at all these flowers is that there are different colors, there are different flower shapes. And so this really encourages a diversity of different pollinators. So not just honeybees, not just bees, um, but also getting some of your butterflies out there. Um, as well as some beetles and flies, they're all really great pollinators for, for different reasons. So the more diverse your, your landscape looks, the more diverse the pollinators should be. Um, one thing I will point out though is um, with um, butterflies and moths, if you look at their mouth parts, um, they're very different from a bee's mouth parts, which we'll look at in just a second. So here, um, just I had some, um, beans and some other things growing and I planted some four o'clocks just to have something pretty out there and they grow rather easily. Um, and so this, let's see if this will play, you'll see how long the proboscis or the tongue of this moth is. And so she's really not coming into contact with that flower. So she's not really moving any pollen around. So sometimes the, the butterflies and moths um, are not as super effective pollinators, but in other um, flowers and in other types of butterflies and moths, they can be good. But that's one reason why um, we really like to look at, at bees for pollination, um, because they do have these shorter tongues and they're oftentimes coming into much closer contact with the flower. Um, and they oftentimes get um, pollen all over their fuzzy bodies. You can see how hairy this honeybee is here. Um, and in doing so, they move pollen from flower to flower really easily. So she has a short tongue, so she's just basically stuffing her face within that flower head, and that's how that pollen gets moved around. Okay, let's see. So back to, you know, what should I plant? So I've already hinted at this already. You know, ideally, we want to have a, a lot of diversity out there to support all the different types of pollinators. Um, ideally, we want to have um, forage across all of the seasons. I know winter is tough. Um, but you've probably noticed that we do have some of these winter days now that um, are extremely warm. Um, and those are days that at least honeybees will actually go out and look for food and they won't find anything. So they're actually burning a lot of energy because they're going out and flying and then coming back empty handed and then having to uh, refuel. Um, so one thing to think about is planting successive batches of flowers, especially if you're doing annuals so that you have sustained um, support and bloom for those um, pollinators out there. Herbs are wonderful um, for pollinators. Uh, I was just out at the uh, UT Gardens on the Knoxville campus the other day, um, and looking at the uh, oregano and thyme that's growing out there, and there are bees all over it. And the nice thing about that is um, if you let your herbs go to flower and then the bees pollinate it, then you have seed and um, a lot of it will reseed for the next year. And you'll end up with uh, more um, herbs than you ever imagined that you could use. And we like to have a mix of annuals and perennials. So it's great to see you guys are already doing that. The nice thing about that is that the annuals will typically bloom the first year. And oftentimes when the bees are visiting that or the pollinators are visiting those plants, they'll pollinate them and then you'll get seed production and then it'll reseed for the next year. And the perennials, that gives the perennials a little bit of time to grow. Some of them won't flower until the second year, sometimes even the third year. Um, and a lot of us don't have that patience. So having that mix between annuals and perennials works out really well. 
Um, so there will be a change across your plot over time too. Um, forage all day is also really an important thing to think about um, that I think oftentimes um, gardeners don't realize that some of your plants aren't producing um, pollen in the afternoon. They, they, plant, they have it, they uh, produce it um, in the morning and then once the bees and the other pollinators come and collect it, um, there's not any more production for the day, it's basically used up. Same thing for some plants with nectar. So I plant a lot of buckwheat for my bees um, as a nectar source. Uh, and it'll, they're, they're visiting it like crazy in the morning, but by afternoon, there's not so many uh, bees out there anymore because they've used it up. So I tried to make sure that when I am planting buckwheat, I'm also planting um, other flowers at the same time that will provide food for the afternoon period. So that's again, we don't understand how a lot of these plants um, or how much they're producing across time. So to get over that, we try to pr um, plant a diversity of flowers. And if you want a diversity in bees, um, there's extended research showing that you get increased pollination. And we'll talk about that um, in the second half as well. Um, and if you want this diversity in bees, or if you want native bees specifically, plant native plants. I think this is pretty intuitive. Um, as gardeners, you guys understand this uh, relationship between flowering plants and pollinators. Um, and so native plants and um, native bees have co-evolved um, for many, many years. Um, so these are the, the best plants to plant if you want to support native bees. I'm going to talk a little bit later about um, why we should be supporting all of the bees, not just native bees. Um, but one thing to consider is that I know there's a lot of um, push for native plants and, and native bees, which is great, um, but honeybees are really important. And when you plant native plants, oftentimes the studies that have looked at um, native plant habitats have really low um, levels of honeybees visiting those areas. So if you are someone who's planting specifically for honeybees, you may want to consider planting some non-natives as well. Ideally something that's not going to be invasive and weedy, um, but some of those non-natives can be um, really great in terms of supporting um, non-native bees. Um, we also want to avoid overly showy ornamentals because they've been bred um, usually by humans for characteristics that we like, um, whether it be you know, double, double petals, that kind of a thing. Um, that's not really what the bees are after. So we really wanna try to stick to the more natural versions of plants um, in order for those pollinators to really do well. Um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about how to plant some of these. And so I'm hoping that this is not going to be really loud when we get to the site. Um, but basically, one of, this is one of my sites that was in South Carolina. Um, and you can see it's just a big grassy, weedy area. Um, nothing particularly wonderful growing here, but can support um, plant life. So um, I decided to try to, to take over that land and, and put a little bit of pollinator habitat there. Um, no irrigation, um, pretty clay soil. The land doesn't get worked um, pretty much at all. Um, so it's, it's tough, it's a tough site. So first we bush hog it down, get all those weeds down, then we um, mow it really low down. Um, then we till and work the soil a bit. And sometimes it takes um, two or three times of, of really working that soil to break down the clumps. Um, and then we drill the seed in. So typically, depending on the type of flower, um, the, the seeds will vary in size. What I was planting here for this type when we were doing the drill seeding um, was buckwheat, and it's a relatively large um, seed. So for this one, um, which is really different than a lot of the wildflower seeds, which are smaller than poppy seeds oftentimes that are just like dust, um, this one we can drill in about um, a quarter inch, and it does a little bit better when it has some soil over the top. So let's see if we can get this playing. So I'm, let me see if it's this. This is just um, a drill that allows the planting of multiple types of seeds at any one given type, time. So I could plant a blend if I wanted to, I could mix them up, um, or I could just plant one type. So at this time when we were planting, it was just um, buckwheat. So I was fortunate enough to be working with um, the, the farm crew, again, the, the farm crew wanting pollination services, realizing that my bees have to be healthy for them to have to pollinate, so they would help out and do this planting for me. I don't have any of my own tractors or anything like that. Um, this is about a, a two acre plot. Um, over time, you can see that the, the buckwheat's coming in really well. Um, again, no irrigation, so the planting time is key. Um, we want to make sure that it's, it's, 
it's going to get enough natural rainfall that it's going to grow and succeed, um, but also it's not, buckwheat is not frost um, hardy at all. So we want to make sure that we wait long enough that the last freeze has already passed. Um, it comes in really well. This is also um, a cover crop that we use for um, a non-chemical herbicide. So if you plant it at a really uh, heavy seeding rate, um, typically more than 50 pounds per acre, uh, it can outcompete some of your weeds. So this is also an, another nice benefit to this plant. Um, also, um, I really like these cover crops and I flip back and forth between them, uh, not only because that buckwheat does provide that weed prevention, but it also is providing nectar and pollen for the bees. And I uh, rotate that with a cover crop blend of um, clover seeds. And I vary the, the clovers, so it's um, actually a mix, I shouldn't say I vary. It's a mix of different clovers. Um, and this is, just happens to be a picture of when the crimson clover was up. And of course, again, the you know knowing that these clovers um, have nitrogen fixing ability. It really helps improve the soil too. So this was a nice way to be able to improve the, the landscape, the land itself, um, in order for plantings later on that will be more permanent. And I just want to show you just a few pictures of the buckwheat plot because I do think it's a beautiful cover crop um, when, it, when it does flourish and do well. Um, here's a little honeybee flying through the area. Um, here we have a carpenter bee, um, also a good pollinator, but yes, also a bit of a pest. Um, here we have a little native fly, um, a skipper, uh, a wasp, a little native bee. So these um, cover crops, even though they aren't uh, native and um, they are in farming areas, um, and oftentimes they're planted by beekeepers, they can really help support a lot of other types of insects as well, including native bees. So um, just, just keep that in mind that these cover crops can actually um, help support some of the native insect community as well. Um, but we've, we're talking about smaller scale, so I realize now um, that most of you are planting smaller um, yard type flower beds, which is wonderful. Um, and that actually, you know, increases your ability to have control over that area and most likely involves more irrigation. Um, when you're planting wildflower blends, one of the benefits is that it can be absolutely beautiful and you can have flowers blooming across an entire season um, rather than having to replant all the time. So there are many seed mixes available. Um, we'll talk about a few resources at the, the end of this, the first half, um, but also remembering that we wanna think about these annuals and perennials and um, doing those mixes and having that irrigation for establishments really, really going to be key. Um, if you're relying on mother nature, it can be a bit of a gamble because sometimes um, the rainfall can be more than what you bargained for and then you have these gullies and gutters that um, will end up beautiful later on in the spring. Um, but it can wash your seed away. Um, a lot of times these wildflower seeds are going to be a lot more costly than your cover crops, but it is a longer term investment um, because you do have this mix of annuals that will reseed as well as perennials that will come back year to year. Um, I think that's a, a nice benefit of those um, wildflower plots. Also, you know, if you don't have this ability or large land and um, you know, farm staff to come out with a, um, a drill seeder, then obviously, you know, that's, that's it's not going to be a, a viable option or a practical option for you to deal with these large um, plots. So these wildflowers can be a really great um, option if you have a smaller area. Let's see. So one thing when you are planting these wildflowers, as I mentioned before, their seeds are so, so um, small oftentimes um, that it helps to have a carrier that you're using to weigh down and distribute, help distribute the seeds um, more evenly across the, the landscape. And so there are different types you can use, but one of the main things is that you want to use something that matches the size of the, um, the seed itself. So when I say oats, I don't mean um, like, you know, whole rolled oats. It's like ground up oat bits, just like the chicken feed is, you know, itty bitty grit size. Sand works really well too, because it also blends in with the um, um, soil. Um, and blends in meaning that it'll be incorporated into the soil. Um, but the nice thing about using these carriers is that it can help you see where you've actually um, broadcast your seed. And so this is just a picture from a um, planting demo that um, I was involved with. And so it really helps where you can see where you've distributed these seeds. It also helps weigh those seeds down and make contact with the soil. And then we just walked over the site um, to help make sure that the, the seeds um, really got pressed into the soil. If you do have um, you know, farm equipment, you can go ahead and um, roll it down so that make sure that you um, make that contact. 
but really if it's a smaller plot you can just walk it through um, and you know if you're doing your first irrigation too that will also help um, get those seeds down making contact with the soil um, so this is a plot out in Knoxville um, and I had leftover seed so we, I just said oh where's a plot where I can dump the seed and fortunately um, Bill Lively is the manager of the organic farm and he is um, wonderful and he helped um, prepare this plot for me and, and seed the, the plot and we did it late last year because they were so busy with everything else happening at the farm and this was a kind of a last minute um, idea um, that we got them planted at the end of the spring early summer so it wasn't the best time to be planting because we're relying a lot on um, natural rainfall and that's when things start to be decreasing um, and there's also a lot of weeds that come up at the same time so this is just a picture from um, I think about September of last year um, so you can see there's a little bit out there, but there's a lot of other stuff out there. Um, there's still a little bit of clover coming up, um, but one thing I will point out is that it still managed to be a functional site, even for some, a few pollinators, which um, I, I feel like as long as I'm helping a few pollinators out there, um, I'm making a difference. And so this really helps a lot, but one thing that's um, not as obvious in this picture, but maybe a little bit higher, or has more resolution in this picture, is what's in the background there. And so there you can see um, all of this um, pigweed that's coming up in the back and that's all seed too. So they're, they've gone to flower already in that seed. Um, and so this site got heavily seeded with more pigweed, which is a really, really um, messy and um, voracious weed out there. Um, so I, was a, I had a little bit of hesitation about what it would look like this year, but it's turned out to be, um, Pretty, pretty good. So this is what it looked like um, March 30th. So um, again, this blend, I didn't mention this before, this um, seed blend was just leftover seeds from a lot of different seed mixes that I had. So it's not any specific, I can, I can tell you what blends are in it, but it's just a mix of about five different blends that each have at least a dozen different plants in there. So it's, it's really just um, the kitchen sink of wildflower seeds. So you can see here, I have some canola blooming, the yellow flowers, um, have some baby blue eyes out there. Um, you know, this is early on in the season, so it, it, was, it was okay for that time of year. Um, there was a plot of um, crimson clover coming up nearby, so that was help feeding my bees. Um, here a little bit later, almost three, three weeks later, later or so, you can still see a lot of those same plants, but it is becoming more lush. There's some Siberian wallflower. Um, on the right hand side, that orange flower. Um, and then magically, you know, three, two and a half weeks after that, then all these poppies started coming up, which I had even for, I'd forgotten that they were in, in the mix. So it ended up being um, a nice surprise going out like right before Mother's Day, even though, um, you know, it's hard to do celebrations for any kind of holidays right now. Um, but it really changed the feel of the plot and it turned out being really beautiful. Um, here you can see there's a lot more diversity. Um, even at the end of May. But if you were just to look at the surface, you'd see a lot of the poppies, but there were other types of poppies. There are um, California poppies out there. Um, there's some delphinium. Um, we had a lot of different variation out there. You can see a lot of the, the clover is providing a little bit more of a um, ground cover well. Um, here's the end of May. Um, at this point, it was just, um, it was, I don't know, I think one of my more pretty plots. It was really gorgeous. And poppies aren't great nectar producers, but they do produce pollen. And so if you want to see bees visiting those plants, they're going to be on there earlier in the day, earlier in the morning, rather than later on. Um, it took a little bit of a change as it started getting hot and dry. So um, just a couple weeks after that, two and a half weeks after that, um, here, here's the plot. Um, so you can see those poppies are starting to die down. There's a lot more dead brown stuff and a lot of that's the clover that's um, finished up. Um, but it's, it's okay, there's still a lot more flowering and there's a lot of different things flowering. So um, it's a little bit strange, but on the other side of the plot, we ended up having a little bit of different um, plants coming up. So I'm gonna show you this short video from taken from the other side of the plot. It's still the same plot. Um, and you can see there's just a lot of different types of plants on this side. Um, and it's supporting more than just um, my bees, obviously. You can see these birds are coming through. Um, they're enjoying it. They're, they might be eating some of the bees, but hopefully they're eating some of the, the bad insects out there as well. Um, but it's really, more, it has more of a prairie feel. Um, and there are still some poppies out there. So that's, I think, one of the most surprising things for me was that those poppies bloomed um, from 
beginning of May, uh, and there there's still some out there. I don't know if the the recent rains will will help um, kind of pump them up, but um, they're not looking fabulous right now. But there's still some out there, so I was surprised by their bloom period. But this just shows you how much the plot has changed over the last four months. Um, let's see. Um, so, oh, I didn't mention. So that plot is about um, three quarters to maybe an acre. Um, this plot, I just put transplanted some seedlings in there um, beginning of last week. Um, and this is probably about 15 feet by 30 feet. Again, no irrigation. The soil is really clay. It's not been worked before. It's not part of the like organic farm. This is out by where my hives are. And so it was just this grass growing here before um, and some clovers and some other um, weedy stuff. Um, but I went out there earlier this week and the deer have come through because it is next to the forest. So I'm gonna be dealing with some different challenges out in, in this site. Um, but just showing that you can do still a larger plot, um, but that's you know, not acres and acres large. Um, but hopefully this one in the next month or so, I'll end up having some nice um, sunflowers and um, I have some echium out there, um, some coneflowers, some other plants that'll be coming up and providing a little bit of later forage for my bees. And then this is just um, a small plot. So those are eight foot landscape timber that I put in the shape of hexagons. So I like to nerd everything up. Um, and so these sites were, or this site was out in South Carolina, um, but just showing if you had just a small wild or small flower bed that you can plant in, um, showing how it can change over time and it does become more lush um, um, with rainfall and time, uh, but also showing again, all these different shapes and colors to attract different types of pollinators out in the environment. Um, and then it does have extended bloom. And that's what we like to see is that diversity of uh, flowers, but also extended across multiple seasons and months. Um, this amaranthus is a little bit, um, it can be a little bit like pigweed where it seeds really easily, um, but I don't mind so much because it provides feed for my bees at a time of the year when there's typically not a lot of um, forage for them. So now I'm at the point where um, I'm out in the field and those poppies are just about done, but it's a great opportunity to go out and um, to hear that rattle. That's because the, the seeds are ready in those and so I've been going out and collecting seed um, because I'm going to have more than enough seed for, to, for this uh, field to be reseeded with poppies and I don't want poppies to overtake the entire field. Um, this is also going to be a way for me to share uh, poppy seeds with other people so they can plant their own um, pollinator gardens in the next year. But this is also just going to show you um, how many poppy seeds are in one of these flower heads. Um, and so that's one thing to consider if it's a long-term plot, it's going to develop over time. And so if you're planting um, a ton of flowers now, it's going to become a very saturated area plot um, in just a year or two because of how many seeds each one of these plants um, can produce for the, for the next generation. So I always try to do a little bit lighter the first year and see what comes up. And then just knowing that they're hopefully going to proliferate and I'm gonna have more plants the next year. Um, so I'm going to leave you for now with this first half. We're going to have a little bit of discussion. I'm sorry, I realize I'm going long here. Um, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, if you haven't checked out their website, it's really great. They have um, under their, their list of uh, native plants, um, they have a, a set of recommendations for um, pollinator plants. A lot of these were helped develop by the Xerces Society, um, which is an invertebrate conservation group. Uh, but you can see that if you wanted to support um, you know, native bees versus bumblebees or honeybees, there's different lists for that. And then one really nice thing is that, oops, I don't have it on this one, um, is that you, when you click on these lists, it'll give you, um, you know, all of these plants specifically for honeybees, but you have some really great search options. And so the search, search options will give you um, the opportunity to um, put some settings in, like is your soil um, dry, is it moist, is it wet? Uh, what kind of light do you have? Are you looking for things that are blooming during certain times of the year? Do you want something that's evergreen? Are you looking for trees? So really great search options there. And then just some other resources. Um, I think I, I might have messed this slide up a little bit too. Um, Ernst Seed, and again, I'm not um, promoting any specific um, um, companies, but this is just one that I've bought from that has some nice um, seed opportunities because they have some nice blends and you can choose what types of um, 
you know, soil types you have, whether or not you want to include grasses or not. Um, you can see that there's, you know, a cost difference here. And typically we're sowing at about um, six to 12 pounds per acre. So if you're, if you have a small area to plant, it's not a big deal. But if you have a large area to plant, um, these can get to be very pretty expensive plots. And so I oftentimes will think about that in terms of um, when I am um, planting, what I will, how much I want to invest in that site, depending on whether or not I have irrigation or what the soil type is like. And this is also one where um, you can get to these lists and then um, pick, oh, actually, I think, so, sorry, this was supposed to go on the previous slide of being able to um, search for these different options within. But the other nice thing about the earth seed is that even when you're looking at specific types of plants, so I, I love goldenrod, they have ecotypes that are more specific to certain areas. So if you really want to try and get something that's um, better for your area, um, you, can, you can see, you know, picking from, obviously for this area, Virginia would be probably a closer pick than picking um, a Pennsylvania ecotype. Um, they're based in Pennsylvania, so a lot of the plants, you'll see a lot of Virginia, um, North Carolina, Pennsylvania options there. But just a really cool, um, company that where you can see some, some variation. And then you'll also see that they give a pollinator value to any of the plants that you're looking at as well. So it's, it's kind of nice if you're wanting to look specifically for pollinators to have that information really readily available. Um, also applewood seeds. So they're based in um, Colorado. Um, I've worked with them before and getting them to make me some custom seed blends. And most of these companies will help make you seed blends as well. Um, they have some nice general um, regional mixes as well, but very general, so like an eastern pollinator mix or a northern or a southern mix, not at all ecotypes and that, that specific. Um, but also, um, you know, on the cheaper end because they aren't as specific either. But they do have ecologists on staff that you can um, talk with that are that are helpful in terms of um, helping you decide what's best for your area. And then brownstone seeds, um, they're based in Kentucky, so they're kind of in the middle. So they have um, some regional blends that also take into consideration um, like your soil moisture um, and where you are and what types of pollinators you want to plant for, um, but not so specifically um, like ecotypes. Um, but you know, hopefully you guys understand that the value of pollinators is not just through um, honey production like with honeybees, but that they're pollinating a lot of the crops that provide food for us. So this is what your breakfast looks like with and without pollinators. You have your fruits missing, your nuts missing. Um, your juice, your jam, and then also your creamer because there are leaf cutter bees that help pollinate alfalfa, which then gets used to feed livestock. So there's an indirect um, advantage there. But uh, the estimate is about a third of what we eat benefits from animal pollination. Um, and of that animal pollination, bees are a big part of that. But we just want to make sure that we understand that there are a lot of different animals that contribute to um, pollination of crops. Um, and the value of these crops that um, it result from insect pollination in the United States is over $29 billion, so that's huge. And of that, um, the majority of it, about two-thirds of it, comes from honeybee pollination. And there's one re multiple reasons for that. Um, one thing we want to think about is that um, this native bee versus non-native bee issue, um, I don't think it should be an issue. I think we should be thinking about all of the bees together and how they help. But one thing I want to point out is um, there is this recent paper that came out that shows the origin of a lot of the food crops that we eat and where they come from. And you can see a lot of the food crops do not originate from the United States or from North America. And so if we're just relying on native bees um, to pollinate a lot of these other uh, crops that aren't native to here, you can have a mismatch. So this is one reason why um, we do implement and use um, bees like honeybees that aren't native because a lot of the crops that we're pollinating are also not native. Another thing, oops, sorry, I don't know why that popped up strangely. Another thing is thinking about um, the types of crops that we grow across the United States um, and that we don't necessarily have all the bees we need for um, pollination in any of those areas. Um, so one nice thing about honeybees is that we can move their colonies around. So this just shows um, this map of migratory beekeeping. So we have a lot of alfalfa grown um, out in the, the I guess, western part of the, the U.S., but more central. We have a lot of berries that are grown on the eastern side, sunflowers in the central region. We have a lot of melons growing, apples, um, cranberries. So oops, a lot of these crops um, need insect pollination or they need cross-pollination. And so this is one advantage of using these honeybees is that we can move them around for these um, crops. Whereas with a lot of the native bees, we can't do that. 
And I'm going to talk a little bit just about honeybees habitat use as an example, um, because native bees use a lot of the same resources, um, but in a little bit of a different way and not quite um, as many resources. So we already talked about this before, that the pollen is a really great resource for the bees because it is their protein resource. So this is what they use to make baby food and feed the developing bees. Um, the adult bees don't need it, but it's for the, the next generation of bees. Obviously, they're honeybees, and even the, the non-honeybees will still collect nectar from the flowers, and that's their carbohydrate resource. Um, the other important reason for the carbohydrates is that the, when the bees, um, honeybees specifically, when they consume a lot of these sugars, they have wax glands that make these wax pellets, and that's what they, is what they use to make that honeycomb. Um, so it makes their building blocks. So that's another reason why it's really important that we have um, good nectar resources for bees. Um, also, they're really good about recycling this wax too, but um, you know, later on in the season when they don't have as many floral resources, they have to recycle because they don't have enough nectar and sugars coming in to make um, new wax. Another really important res resource is propolis. So this is tree uh, resin. So it's like a really thick sap. And this has been shown to have antimicrobial uh, qualities to it um, and really help with the bees, even in terms of viruses. So um, it's a really nice resource that the bees need to have. Um, this is another reason why trees are so important for um, these landscapes for pollinators. And when we talk about nutrition, um, I always say nutrition is important from day one, but day one is not when this um, adult bee emerges. Day one is actually when we have young developing bees um, being fed. So as soon as the egg hatches, that's when nutrition is, is really going to be important. And that can determine um, the longevity and lifespan of that adult bee later on. So it's really important that we think about having good nutrition for these developing bees, not just these adult bees. And also remembering that nutrition is more than, um, or a healthy colony is more than just being um, free of disease. It's being really well nourished. Um, and also knowing that um, when we feed, you may hear beekeepers say, oh, I'm feeding my bees syrup. When we're feeding them syrup, we're feeding them sugar water, and that is not the same as honey. And I think we all know that. We don't pay for sugar water like we do for honey. And there are actually substances in the honey that can help the bees detoxify chemicals. So this is another reason why we want to be really careful about having enough forage for the bees out in the environment and not harvesting um, too much honey because we want to leave them um, with enough for themselves so they can be as healthy as possible. Um, just a few resources. I don't expect you guys to have a lot of interest in this, but just wanted to show you that there is published um, research and studies showing how um, the foraging resources can have more than just nutritional value, that there are these phytochemicals in the nectar and the pollen that can help the bees fight off things like viruses. It can also help them deal with um, pathogen tolerance, so some gut microbe issues, um, and also just whether or not they have good pollen uh, or enough pollen when they're young can affect their susceptibility to um, pesticides when they become adult bees. So it's really important that we have good foraging resources out there for uh, all of our pollinators, not just the bees, but we're using bees as a um, model system here. The other thing to keep in mind, let me see if I can turn down the volume on this one, um, is that when we have a lot of foraging, we can reduce robbing behavior. And that's what's happening here is this time of year, um, it's starting already where the bees are looking for um, carbohydrate resources wherever they can. So if there's not enough um, flowering plants with nectar out in the environment, they will steal nectar and honey out from each other's colonies. And this re results in the possibility of disease transmission because we have a lot of bees not keeping their social distance. Um, and they're also um, fighting with one another. And this can also um, lead to the bees being more defensive. The next time you go in and do an inspection of these bees, they're going to be on edge. Um, also, you know, I touched on this before when we talk about native bees versus non-native bees. I really don't like it when people try to pit the bees against one another, one another and they blame like honeybees for native bees not having enough food. The solution to this problem is to plant more forage so all of the bees are well fed and they can all be sustained in the environment. And then we will also then have a diversity of foods and food crops available to us. Um, and we also know based off of research that the amount of forage can also impact pollination services. So if you don't have enough good feed bees for your plant or plants for your bees, um, the pollination services go down and then we don't have enough um, or quality food for them to feed the humans. Um, I just want to touch on this for a second because I'm going to brag on my honeybees a little bit. 
is that they're not only producing honey, which also has medicinal purposes, but they're also providing pollen, which some people consume for um, allergy reasons. They also are producing that wax that can be used in candles and soaps and lotions. Um, and you can also ferment the honey into a honey wine. So there's a lot of different things we can get um, from these um, pollinators beyond just pollination services. But all of these things require a healthy, well-fed colony. So that's why forage is really important for um, bees, no matter what you're keeping them for. Um, and when we're talking, if we're talking specifically, specifically about honeybees, um, there's a little bit of difference in terms of what we plant. And so one thing I wanna point out is, uh, in this picture, you can see the bee on the right has a really solid orange, yellowish orange pollen node, and the one over here on the left has a really dark, um, almost dark purplish black with a little bit of a bullseye there of a, of a lighter pollen. Honeybees, most of the time, we're talking like over 90% of the time, they are foraging on one species of flower on their, their, their foraging trip. They don't mix up flowers. And that's one thing that makes them really great um, pollinators is that it's not going to do the plants any good if, if this bee goes and visits an orange tree and collects some pollen and then takes it to a blackberry plant because that cross-pollination isn't going to result in a fruit. So when they stay with one species of, um, of plant per trip, they're just moving pollen within that species. And so that's how you're going to get effective pollination. And this is just showing, I've only you know, taken two pictures of this in my 20 years of beekeeping, um, showing these different, these mixed pollen loads. This is pretty rare. So this is one thing when we think about planting for honeybees is that uh, because they have this floral fidelity and stay with one type of flower, diversity is good, but if you're creating such a diverse floral environment, the bees are having to search for that same type of flower on their foraging trip, that it makes their trip um, inefficient, it can actually be a little bit of a detriment. So we wanna make sure that we have some floral diversity out there, but not 400 different plants and only three of each plant that the bees have to go and try and find those three out in the, the the landscape to collect that same type of pollen. Another nice thing about honeybees is that they have a large foraging range. So typically when we're talking about honeybees, they can find food within a two mile radius. And if we talk about a two mile radius, that's actually um, about 8,000 acres. Sorry, that got cut off there, um, which is good and, and somewhat bad. So they can come into your area and pollinate your yard, even if you aren't nearby. But it also means that if they don't like what you're growing and there's something growing better um, you know, a mile away, they may go visit that site um, instead. So it, it complicates them a little bit. Um, whereas some of the native bees will actually not forage very far at all. And some of the really small native bees will only go about 500 yards or so. And so just pointing out that we have a lot of great um, different types of bees and pollinators out there. Um, it's believed that we have about 4,000 species in, in the United States, which is huge. Most, obviously, most of these bees are not managed and they're um, flying wild. And most of them are solitary. Um, and a lot of them are ground nesting bees. And I just wanted to show you this really quickly because if you're growing things like tomatoes, you need um, these larger bees that do buzz pollination. And honeybees do not do buzz pollination. So for your solanaceous plants, your tomatoes and peppers, um, these bumblebees particularly are really good. And so what you'll See, this is a bee on a um, partridge pea, a bumblebee visiting partridge pea, but you'll hear her buzzing as she works this flower. Oops. Let's see here. And that buzzing is the bee using her thoracic muscles and buzzing against that flower, which releases the pollen. So the solanaceous plants don't have the pollen out and about. They, they need that buzzing in order to release the pollen. And then she collects it on her belly and um, then swipes it up onto her legs into those nice little pollen loads. So again, that's another reason why we want to have this diversity of pollinators is that um, these native bees do a much better job at buzz pollination than honeybees. So different bees for different purposes. And these ground nesting bees, of course, are, are really important, especially for a lot of um, the crops that we have. Um, but we want to think about, too, that uh, um, how we manage our, our landscape is really important. So um, wanting to be careful about, in, you know, the farm setting, making sure we're careful about tilling up these um, nests that are in the ground. But even in the home setting, making sure as, as important as mulch can be for reducing the use of herbicides, which can be harmful to pollinators, if you put too thick of a um, uh, layer of mulch and you don't have any exposure for these uh, native or ground nesting bees to get down to the soil, that's going to um, 
decrease their, their nesting as well. And so you want to pay attention, look in your landscape for some of these um, really small, inconspicuous nests that are out there. Um, sorry, that went kind of quickly, but oftentimes people think these are just like worm castings, but really this is just um, native bee nests clearing up um, their cleaning house essentially after a storm. Um, and just a few resources to show you that these, and I, I think I have this in the uh, Milan no-till field day presentation too, if you want more information, but just showing that really it's the diversity in bees that can help a lot of these crops in terms of their yield. So all these bees working together and in different ways is really important. Um, also just want to touch on these other types of pollinators. So plant tissues for nesting materials and other types of um, bees, but also um, as food sources for other types of butterflies and moths like this monarch here. Great. All right. Thank you all for hanging on and for joining us. And I hope that you get out and enjoy the, 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 your landscapes and your plant life. That's one great thing about working from home. It's like I get to appreciate it a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. We appreciate very much your expertise and, uh, and your presentation today, Jennifer. It was great to have you. We got lots of great comments in the chat box. So just as a reminder to everybody, um, I'll go ahead and format this recording, put it on YouTube, get it sent back out to you. Um, Jennifer can send me any resources that she would like to send along to you. I will pass those along. And for Master Gardeners on the call, we look forward to seeing you on July the 17th and July the 31st for some of the rest of our upcoming Friday Zoom meetings. So thanks so much, everybody, for joining in. Have a great afternoon and best wishes on all of your pollinator plantings. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.